Hello and welcome to the Pretty Good Gaming Daily Triple, your no shit gaming news video. That's three news stories in one video with zero faff. Halo Infinite was meant to be the Xbox Series X's big launch title, but after being indefinitely delayed in August, the console was left with little of significance at launch. The current creative director, former Bungie-era Halo veteran Joseph Staten, explained his return to the franchise and the new release window in a blog post on Halo Waypoint. After Halo Reach shipped, I became a Halo fan, cheering on 343 from the sidelines, but I've spent the last four months immersing myself into the Halo universe, and it's my honor as creative director to help our team ship Halo Infinite in fall 2021. Fall, or autumn for those of us who can speak correctly, typically lasts between September and November, as I'm sure anyone who made it through primary school will know. Although, based on most internet discourse, it doesn't look like many people did. Are you stupid or something? The game was initially set to launch alongside the Xbox Series X and S, which officially released on the 10th of November this year. That means this new window for Halo Infinite is pretty much an entire year after its original release date. Delays are always good as it means the game will be at least somewhat better, though the amount of delays it actually takes to make the game good is up for debate. Any delays would have helped Anthem become a good game, but it would probably have taken a lot for it to actually be a good game. However, delaying the game pretty much a whole year speaks even more to the tumultuous development of Halo Infinite. Staten elaborated on the reason for such a hefty delay and suggested that it's to avoid crunch without overtly saying it, thus he won't be breaking any promises when it inevitably does happen. I joined 343 right as the team was wrestling with feedback from the July campaign demo. This discussion boiled down to one fundamental truth. We needed more time to do things right. That included pushing hard in the fall, giving the team time to recharge over the holidays, and then coming back in January to finish the game at a healthy pace. The reception to that gameplay seems to have been the driving force behind the game's delay, and it's really not hard to see why. Now, the game doesn't look outright terrible, but it certainly isn't of the AAA standard that we'd expect from Xbox's number one mascot that, at the time, was out in just a few months. With the blog post, we also got a number of new screenshots, which look much more impressive than what was previously shown. Obviously, these aren't indicative of the final product or how it will look in motion, but it does seem like some of the art direction is getting back on track. The armor of the Spartan looks much more tactical and combat ready than it did before and less like an action figure. The style of Halo Infinite as a whole seems to be a return to the Bungie era look of Master Chief and it's something I'm really happy about because Halo 4 and 5's designs just never really clicked with me. The post is quite long and has lots of insights from the art team so please check it out for yourself to get the full story. Director of Art Management Neil Harrison explained how the original gameplay demo from July just missed the mark. The primary goal for the campaign demo in July was showing Halo Infinite gameplay for the first time. While that aspect generally landed as we wanted, the reality is that the art and visuals were not at the bar we hold for Halo, even in a work in progress state. Much of the feedback we heard from the community aligned with our own views and work we were already committed to doing around things like indirect lighting, material response, foliage and tree rendering, clouds, level of detail transitions and character fidelity. Still, the feedback was humbling and it also pushed us to look at additional opportunities for improvement. Even if it's not true, it certainly looks like the creative team over at 343 are taking the responsibility seriously and using the criticism to make the game the best it can be. Ultimately, we won't know any more until we see some more of the supposedly upgraded visuals, but I think it's unlikely that we'll see anything for a while, and honestly, I don't really want to. Since we've got to wait until September at the earliest, I'd rather the team works on making the game as good as possible before worrying about showing it off. I wouldn't expect to see some gameplay until spring next year, but hey, I could be wrong, we could even get something at the Game Awards tomorrow. Recently, the game lost a director, and not for the first time, so whatever is happening over there definitely doesn't look good from the outside. But this blog post definitely says some of the right things and shows a couple of promising screenshots, but it could very easily all be bullshit that we've all seen before, so don't get your hopes too high. On balance though, this has made me more excited for the game than I was before reading it, even if only by a little. And next up, with Cyberpunk mere hours away, reviews are in and it's looking pretty great, apart from some frequent bugs that could be ironed out over time. But the game has not been without its fair share of controversy, and that hasn't stopped just because the game is about to launch. One of the most recent controversies, if you can even really call it that and I'm not sure I would, is actually something that's a little personal to me. In an article by Game Informer, they brought up the challenges faced by epilepsy sufferers when playing Cyberpunk 2077 with all its neon sci-fi strobe lighting. Writer Liana Rupert explained that she suffered one major seizure while playing and felt others come on a few times. Her article is designed to simply serve as a PSA for any fellow sufferers of epilepsy and isn't directly critical of CD Projekt, it's just a warning. She specifically mentions brain dancing, an activity where the player will wear a headset and see through another's eyes, and this is what caused the seizure. The headset comes on with strobing effects 
effects in red and white which are very similar to the actual medical practice of deliberately inducing an episode. Since this is so similar to what a professional doctor might do, this could be a potential trigger for epileptics or even those who are unaware of their condition. Photosensitive epilepsy has been a potential concern for gamers for years, and most games come with some kind of a warning before the menu, even if they don't have particularly aggressive lighting effects. Literally, the first thing you see when you boot up a PS4 is an epilepsy warning, but an extra warning about the risks or settings to remove them will benefit many people. CD Projekt actually responded on Twitter and explained that they plan on introducing a warning. Thank you for bringing this up, we're working on a separate warning in the game, aside from the one that exists in the EULA. Regarding a more permanent solution, Dev Team is currently exploring that and will be implementing it as soon as possible. It's disheartening, although not unsurprising, to see several people criticising the article and saying things like, if you have epilepsy just don't play the game. Here I thought we were making great strides in video game accessibility this year. One guy even said, gamers care more about microtransactions and that the average consumer doesn't care. But this isn't about the average consumer, it's not about you, get out of your bubble for one second. It's not about you! Warnings are already there in the terms of service and the onus is on you to check for sure, but adding an extra warning literally does no harm to anyone and will help people know if they can play the game comfortably without fear of a seizure. However, a warning alone isn't good enough. If brain dance is made specifically to look like what can trigger seizures, and the option to change it should be implemented because brain dance is necessary as part of the story. My brother has epilepsy and while his case isn't directly affected by lights or strobing, it is still a concern he'll have to live with for the rest of his life. If any of you have seen or even directly experience a seizure, you'll know how quite horrific and even dangerous they can be. Seizures in the comfort of your own home will most likely be fairly harmless, but that's not a guarantee. You could easily fall off the chair and hit your head on the ground, which could literally kill you. An extra warning and the ability to switch off triggering lights would do a world of good to people who suffer from epilepsy or related conditions, and people who may not know that they do. And if you want to be cold and corporate about it, making the game more friendly to epileptics will mean more people can buy it and make more money. Leona Rupert's article is, as the title suggests, a public service announcement, a warning, not a lecture, or an outright criticism of the game. I think I may come across a bit annoyed in this segment, at least a little more than usual, but the sheer ignorance of some people continues to astound me. It is your responsibility to make sure you can safely play the game, but making that information clearer and adding the ability to remove the strobing is only a good thing and doesn't harm your experience in any way. And finally, the Game Awards go live tomorrow where we'll see what was voted the best at certain categories, but one award has been given already. Sucker Punch's excellent Samurai Open World World action adventure Ghost of Tsushima won the Player's Choice Award after five rounds of voting. This vote is entirely decided by the public and it beat out Doom Eternal, Spider-Man Miles Morales, Hades and The Last of Us 2. I'm very happy to see Ghost of Tsushima win as it's my number two for Game of the Year behind Doom Eternal. However, it's not only the US election that is allegedly fraudulent this year as the vote has been under a great deal of scrutiny after Ghost snatched the victory at the last minute. Some are claiming that this is entirely the fault of anti-Last of Us mobs from sites like 4chan. There is some evidence to suggest that people People voted not because they wanted Ghost to win, but because they wanted Last of Us to lose, but I'm not going to entertain such conspiracy theories here. Theories like that undermine the great work that Sucker Punch did with the game and devalues the votes of those who legitimately voted for the game they thought was the best. Personally, I preferred Ghost of Tsushima to Last of Us 2, but I voted for Doom anyway, and who really gives a shit about these awards? And that's your lot for today. If you enjoyed this no shit format, go ahead and give the video a like to give it a boost. Hit subscribe and the bell if you want to stay up to date on all future installments. Toss a coin your YouTuber over at patreon.com forward slash pretty good gaming. That's all for today. I've been Henry Cooper. Bye for now.